Today on Front Row Rugby, my guest is Springbok legend, Tennis Dalport. Tennis, it's lovely to have you here. Thanks, Peter. It's uh, great to be on. I um, wouldn't quite say legend status, though, but uh, no, thanks. Uh, thanks for the introduction. That's very humble of you. We're going to start with the trivia question before the conversation starts. In 1998, the Springboks scored a then record 96-13 test match win. Who were the opponents? If you know the answer to that question, you can put it in the comment section below and we'll find out from Tinnis if he knows the answer, but we'll do that at the end of the conversation. So Tinnis, let's get started. What was it like to run out onto the field for the Springboks for the very first time against Canada? Oh, Peter, that was, um, yeah, it was just amazing. You know, it's uh, every, every young rugby player's dream to represent your country. Um, and in our case, of course, the Springboks, and you know, it's, it's just a dream come true, and it's it's so hard to explain, but um, you know, it's it's just that that whole realization that I'm I'm now living my dream. You know, it's a, it's a phenomenal, you know, phenomenal experience. Admittedly, it was only five ten minutes, um, you know, down in down in East London against um, against Canada, so it's just gone so quickly. You know, I can't I can hardly remember anything. It's more. You know, it's more la the later test, but, you know, it was just such a hype. Um, you know, the adrenaline was going um, so excited. So, no, it's, it's phenomenal. It's a phenomenal feeling. You know, as I said, it's just that realization that this is your dream and, and you're living your dream. Now, I know you started on the bench. As you said, you, you came on uh, towards the end. Were you actually expecting to get onto the field? Well, in those days, it was slightly different, um, you know, where you, you only really got on um, if, you, if you were... If, if there was an injury, you know, it's, it's unlike the rotation systems that they, well, uh, they do now where it's tactical substitutions and, you know, you know, you will most likely be involved in, in the full 80 or in the 80 minutes. So, but no, it was mentioned that um, I will get towards the end. You know, luckily it was um, only Canada, dare I say that, but it's, uh, you know, there wasn't that pressure and it was a great way to be initiated into Springbok rugby and, and playing for the Springboks. You know, it's uh, Talk about that managing of management of pressure um, and slowly introducing a, a, a player into the cauldron of, of uh, international rugby. Hey, if you're enjoying this video, why not hit the like button? So a few weeks later, you got your first start. That was against Australia. But by then, you had already played fullback, wing and centre uh, for the Springboks. How much of an asset do you think your versatility was to the coach? Look, it's, it's always one of those big questions. Um, that's asked in rugby, do you, do you specialize in one position or have you got the ability, the the versatility to be a utility back? And I was always in a team, you know, I always added something because I could cover any of the positions in the back, in the back three, um, potentially outside center. So I think my three starts I had was uh, the first one was on the left wing against Australia. Uh, the third one, uh, you know, the, the second start was on the right wing against New Zealand um, in Christchurch. And my third start was was back on, uh, you know, fullback um, against the All Blacks. So, you know, it does bring a lot of, um, you know, versatility to the team, to the team selection. If you can cover those, uh, those positions, we, you know, you see now uh, the modern day player um, has has got the ability to play in multiple positions. And that's. You know, that's the real advantage of having a player with um, that can cover and know the different roles of, of different positions. A couple of videos ago, I actually had Ruan Pinner on the show. I'll put a link up to that here. Um, and he is actually or was in a very similar position to you where he could cover so many different positions in the back line. And I spoke to him about that same issue, the versatility and that being an asset. But at the same time, and, and maybe it was more the case in your era where a coach, I mean, in your case, it would have been uh, Nick Mallet, but maybe a coach wouldn't really know what to do with a player like yourself. So what would your advice be to a youngster who has that ability to play in multiple positions? My advice is, is keep playing in multiple positions. Um, you know, the game has changed. The your, your the number on your back is is, is just to, to fill the shirt. You know, the positions do change. You you look at the, how multi-skilled players now are. They've got to be able to slot in, in and, and be asked different questions by coaches. So do stick to it. Of course, you'll always have a favorite position. Um, you know, try and get into your favorite position as much as possible. Demand that you play in that position as much as possible, but be flexible to to change. You know, that is 
that is the great greatest asset you have because you will always be involved and that is your worth to the team because ultimately as much as we we drive our own ambitions it's it's the ambition of the team that that always comes first and if you are that team player um, you will succeed and, and excel in whatever position you do play okay tennis it's 2000 we're playing the all blacks at ellis park go on then tell us about that match oh well that is that is the one match you know that's my um, bit of advice to any young player all you have to do is score beat the all blacks and score a try against the all blacks and you know your rugby career is made you know what what a memory what a memory you know from the moment because um ellis park at that stage was my home ground where i was playing for the lions um so you know emotionally I, I had a massive attachment to it coming through you know the junior stages and and being able to play at ellis park and then facing the haka you know jonah lomu in there um you know christian cullen was my was my direct opposition but you know, you, you don't really get the opportunity to play against uh, at fullback, really, your direct opposition. But it was just amazing. You know, you, you sing the anthem, you um, you know you're living the dream, you you know that everyone watching you at the stadium uh, on television want to be where you are right there. And that that is just a phenomenal, you know, a phenomenal memory that, you, that you'll always treasure. And, you know, the fact that we beat the All Blacks in a very high-scoring match, it was very exciting. You know, we took the lead, they came back, and we, we, we you know, we won it in the end again. Um, and being able to score, you know, a great try against them just capped it all off. You know, that was, that is probably, well, that is definitely the standout moment of, of my record career. I know at the beginning of the interview, you were very humble about your legendary status, but I think that performance by itself, if that was the only thing you ever did in a Springbok jersey, guaranteed legendary status, I can tell you that much. So, Tinas, um, shortly after that, the Nick Mallet era came to an end and he was replaced by Harry Phil Yoon. Talk to me about the differences in the coaching methods that you experienced by those two men. Yeah, no, I think unfortunately... Um... <sighs> That period of, of rugby, South African rugby, you know, that two, three years around 2000 or 2001, 2002, 2003, um, probably won't be remembered as the glory years because we've, you know, we had three three national coaches within two years. Um, yeah, it was totally different, absolutely different. You know, Nick was very much hand on, hands on coaching, very emotional, um, where Harry was more of a manager. Um, he you know, didn't particularly do that much of the hands-on stuff. Um, we got a lot of consultants in. That's the era of all the Australian, um, Tim Lane, uh, Mick Byrne, where's in Les Kiss. They, they were sort of brought in in that era. So a lot of the cons consultative coaching was, was brought in. Um, so it was, you know, it's a totally different different coaching and man managerial side uh, that, that, you know, that the two coaches... Uh, head coaches had so tennis after harry came in you sort of stayed in the side we played france and italy at the beginning of 2001 but then you didn't play a test match again until 2003 was that because of injury or was there something else going on no definitely not injury no i was fit um yeah it was just again with with harry being there it was a, a changing of the guard really where you know i made my mark really under nick you know 97 end of year tour um, and then being picked to start in, in 2000. So Harry, Harry changed it. Uh, you know, I wasn't picked for, for the Springbok Tour at the end of 2001 um, because of uh, well, various different uh, um, things that happened. So, um, you know, at that stage, I, we had a bit of a decision to make. Uh, you know, at a consulting with my dad, we discussed you know, where am I going to take my rugby because of, of uh, the decision that was made. And we sort of made the decision then that, um, you know, I was going to start looking abroad to, to see um, if there are any opportunities there. We felt that because of the political situation um, and the short career really of a, of a rugby player that um, I was going to, going to look abroad to see where my opportunities lie. Um, moved over, as I mentioned earlier, I was, uh, moved to the UK in July 2002 um, to join Gloucester um, and then really from my performance at Gloucester um, and what you know Rudolf Strali took over the, the you know the Springboks in late 2002 um, and then building into the 2003 Rugby World Cup had a really good season with Gloucester and there were a couple of injuries 
in the South African uh, system. And um, I was asked to come back to, to play in 2003 again. And I assume that you would have gone to come Staldraat then as well? No, absolutely. Um, still got my T-shirt. T- tell us a little bit more. Elaborate about what happened there that, uh, that uh, during that infamous time. Yeah, well, I mean, the, the less say the better. I've, uh, I've just started sleeping properly in the last year or two. So thanks for, thanks for reminding me on that. Um, no, it was, a, it was an interesting take on uh, preparation for, for a World Cup. It's one of those memories that you get nightmares on. Um, try not to to think about it too many too many times. But no, it was um, look, it was um, it was felt by Rudolf and his coaching team that this was the way to really galvanize the team um, and get us prepared, um, you know, for for the Rugby World Cup. You know, with all the challenges and pressures that come with a World Cup, and um, they wanted to try and replicate a bit of that pressure and. Um, get us a little bit closer. So, you know, hindsight is always a perfect science. And um, ultimately, you can only make decisions with the information that you have at that time. Um, you know, looking back, it was clearly not the right thing to do, um, uh, you know, scientifically to approach the mat, uh, you know, a massive tournament like that, you know, to put our bodies through stress like we did. Um, you know, people will frown on that now. But, you know, I think unfortunately also for me, I... Um, I was in an Agloster team at that side that had Phil Vickery. They had um, Trevor Woodman and Andy Gomesall. Uh, that was part of the World Cup winning, um, England World Cup winning side. So, of course, when we came back to England um, after the Rugby World Cup, we compared notes in, uh, like you do in preparation and, you know, heard, heard their approach, which was totally the opposite to, to our approach, uh, you know, under Clive Woodward. You know, guys like Phil Vickery actually picked up um, you know, a couple of kilograms in camp. They had their own chef. You know, they it, it was just a total different way of approach from from their side to our side. And you know, you could clearly understand now why um, you know they won the World Cup and and why they were in a in a better position than us. I think it's fair to say that the 2003 Springboks were unlikely to win that World Cup. But how determined were you guys to prove the doubters wrong? When you pull over the Springbok shirt, um, you just have that belief that you are going to win. Um, you know, we are the Springboks. Um, again, looking back at the quality of players that we had, the disruptions that we had, you know, it was probably unlikely. And um, but at that stage, you know, early 2000s, we, we still had that, that belief that the Springboks, um, you know, will win, you know, especially after 99, where the Springboks came so close. You know, it was that miracle drop goal from, from Stephen Larkham that, that kicked us out. Um, we, 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 we went into the tournament with that belief. If you, you now look soberly, look, look back um, at it and you say, right, there were clear um, clear point is that you know we we did not have the squad to to pull us through and and go any further. You know, unfortunately, we we got the All Blacks in the quarterfinals, and um, you know they they were the form team that that um, that year. You know, they put fifty points on the Springboks, they put fifty points on Australia, um, and then you know Australia turned them over in the semi final. So you know we we didn't have the right draw. Of course, things could have been a lot different. You know, we went into the England game at halftime. It was six all. Um, you know, Buckies and, and and Victor, they were starting to just wrap the lineouts. You know, they, their real, their leadership group was under pressure. If you think about Martin Johnson, Lawrence Delalio, um, you know, they were having a go at each other. And if it wasn't for a charge down, you know, try... That, that really took the game out of our hand, it, it could have been different. If, if Louis, you know, if Louis kicked a couple of his, his early penalties, which was difficult penalties, but, you know, if we went into 12, a 12 6 lead half time, the pressure on them was different. They would have made different decisions at the game time um, and might have let, you know, something slip. Um, you know, and, and the game could have been different and we would have been in a different draw um, in the pool uh, or, you know, in, in the playoff stages. But, yeah, no, I think we, you know, realistically, looking back now, um, it was it wasn't a a World Cup winning s- squad that we had. Although we believed it, of course we believed, it, and then we we prepared to win the World Cup, but ultimately we came short. I mentioned earlier that I had Corne Kricher here a few episodes ago, and he also spoke about that pool game against England. And the way that he described it was that if the Springboks could beat England 
then you guys knew you wouldn't have to play New Zealand in the quarterfinals. Do you think that that defeat to the English in Perth actually had a deflating effect on the squad? No, I wouldn't say that. I mean, you do take you do take a loss, and you know it's it is not nice. Um, you know, you just had to rebuild. You know, we we again we had the confidence that we could take on anyone. If you if you want to win the World Cup, you've got to be able to beat you know any any comers in in front of you. So. Um, you know, we had a, a really good good game against um, Samoa before we we played in the semi final um, in the quarter final. So, you know, with that confidence was was going up again. You know, we were able to give young players like Derek um, and Jacques Fury at that stage was was just coming through skull. Um, they got some game time against Georgia and against um, Samoa. So, you know, there was exciting talent coming through and. You know that was uh, that was the selections that was made um, to play to play against the All Blacks. So, despite the quarterfinal defeat, tennis, what was your World Cup experience like? No, it was, you know, again amazing um, to to be able to to play at the highest level in in the highest level of competition. As I said, with um, you know with having a few teammates, uh, Gloucester teammates in the England side, um, I had a, a teammate um, Terry Fanalua who was playing for for Samoa. So it was great being out there with these guys that was my current teammates and, and then playing against them internationally. Unfortunately, my uh, my international career finished on a bit of a low note. Um, you know, running running into Jerry Collins is is not a great way to finish your finish your international career. So ultimately, it it ended on a uh, ended of a bit of a disappointing note. You know, uh, we lost against the All Blacks in the quarter final. Um, I had to go off just be prior to half time, being absolutely smashed by by Jerry. So, you know, it wasn't the greatest of my Springbok career, um, the finish. But you know, overall, I look back and it, it it was a phenomenal experience being out in Australia representing South Africa and the Springboks at the World Cup. Okay, so you may have actually answered the next question anyway, but I'm going to ask you: Who was the toughest opponent that you came up against? Well, no, Jerry was very tough, but you know, he wasn't a direct. Op- um, you know, op- opposition player, um, opponent. You know, toughest was was Jonah. You know, there's there's no doubt about it. You know, to to play against um, a player that has absolutely changed the shape of of rugby, the shape of an outside back. Um, you know, it was it was phenomenal to play against him. You know, the reason why I started my second test on test on the right wing was, um, you know, I was asked by Nick. To, to move over, you know, Brayton, Brayton was on the other wing. He normally played on the right, um, you know, and he asked me, listen, would you, would you mind moving over to try and uh, try and keep Jonah from scoring? You know, which, uh, which of course, you know, you cut me and you cut any Springbok and their, and their blood is green and, and you'll do anything for the team. Um, so I moved over. So um, still proud and, and happy to, to be able to defend the record of, of Jonah never scoring against the Springboks. But, um, you know, we, we lost that ma- match at, at Jade Stadium in Christchurch. As you say, Jonah Loma, the great man, never actually scored a try against South Africa. Very proud uh, record that actually, uh, I think, for the Springboks. So, Tennis, just before we finish up, go on then. Share a funny or a memorable moment with us from your time with the Springboks. Funny or... Well, that is so tough. Um, I think there was... a. Uh, well, the thing is, though, what happens on tour stays on tour. So, you know, I can't, uh, I can't really disclose any of those uh, of those moments. But no, it it, it was great. You know, it's um, being a Springbok in those days. You know, it's 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 changed now. It's, it's a lot more professional um, than it used to be in the early, you know, late nineties, early two thousands. Um, it's we we had a we had some really good times. Um, but you know that that change that has all sort of changed. You know, it's. Uh, um, it's 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 just all a good memory. A lot of it is just a blur um, because of other reasons. But you know, it was it was a fantastic time. It's touring is is fantastic and and great to see at the with the end of the year tour now um, to Europe that a couple of midweek games are, are being played. You know, my first tour was in '97 to Europe. Um, never played a test, but you know, played against the the French Barbarians, uh, France A. Um, you know, so that that all adds to to touring um, and and making it a, a special memory for not just the, the, the guys that go on tour, but for also for the hosting clubs. You know, it's so great to see the, the Springboks will be going out to Bristol um, and, and, and playing other sides rather than just Test Match Rugby. All right, let's have a look at that trivia question again. In 1998, the Springboks scored a then-record 96-13 Test Match win. 
who were the opponents? Tennis, go on in. Do you know the answer? Yeah, no, I know the answer. I actually know one or two of those players that played um, in the opposition to the Springboks, and they uh, they uh, still don't, uh, you know, remember that fondly. They uh, that's one of those big things that will always be against them. Um, yeah, there was Wales. That is quite right. Uh, Tennis, I can tell you that to date, you're only the second guest to get the trivia question right. So well done to you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Tennis, uh, that's how we're going to wrap it up. I want to just say thank you again very much for being available. It was lovely having you on Front Row Rugby. And hopefully we can have you on again in the future. Great. Thanks, Peter. Last time on Front Row Rugby, David Von Hesslen was here. You can go and watch that video. It's appearing on your screen right now. Next time, James Dalton will be here. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed that video, why not spear tackle the like button? You can also subscribe and hit the notification bell so you don't miss any content from Front Row Rugby. See you next time.